Hi everyone. In a previous video, I went over how to configure always-on availability groups in SQL Server 2012. In this video, I'll go over availability groups in a bit more detail and cover what you can do with them after they're configured. And I'll also go over some issues you may run into and how to resolve them. I have here a group setup called Test Group 1. It has three replicas or servers where this one is currently the primary. There are three databases in this group so if one of them fails all of them will fail over to the secondary. And I have my listener set up. First let's take a look at the availability group dashboard. This gives an overview of the current state of your availability group. It gives a list of the servers in the group as well as the databases involved. From here, you can easily see which ones are the primary and secondary servers, the failover mode, and whether the data is synchronized or not. You can start a failover from here in the upper right. You can view the health event logs and you can also view the custom quorum information. Let's go ahead and fail over to the secondary. Select the server to fail over to. We'll need to connect to it first. And then finish. It failed over successfully, but we get a warning here saying that the quorum vote configuration is not recommended for this availability group. To correct this issue, let's first view the custom quorum information. The quorum model that I'm currently using is node and file share majority. I have my three nodes plus a file share witness and each of them gets to vote on the quorum's health. The way I have it set up now is not Microsoft's recommended way. To view their recommendation here's a convenient link at the bottom here. I'll click on that. It'll bring us to a page where you could read up on what a quorum is. And if we scroll down a little, we'll see their recommended adjustments to quorum voting. So here they recommend that you include the primary nodes and also include the secondary nodes that can be automatically filled over to. Otherwise, for the other secondary nodes, they should be excluded. And the quorum should have an odd number of votes. But here, I have an even number of votes with four, and also I'm including a secondary node that is not configured for automatic failover. So I should not give this DU server the ability to vote. To remove its ability to vote, run the following command in the command prompt. The command is cluster.exe, then the cluster name, node, the name of the node, and then we want to set the node weight property to zero. Now when I view the quorum info, we see it no longer gets a vote. Let's try failing over now. And now we don't get the warning anymore. One thing to note when failing over an availability group is that all connections to it will get dropped. You'll need to establish a new connection to continue working. One last thing about the dashboard, you can view the health events for your group. 
This is utilizing the extended events feature. By default, it only shows two columns, but you can right click and choose to add more. So I add availability group name, current state, message, and the statement. So I could easily add these here. And in the statement column, I can even see the actual T-SQL command used. One of the most useful features of availability groups is the ability to have read-only replicas. You can allow your secondary databases to be read-only. This way, you can offload read transactions to your secondary servers. You can also schedule backups to run on the secondary servers, and you could run other maintenance and admin tasks on that secondary, like running a DBCC check DB. This way, you don't have to burden your primary server with all these tasks. You can check on the server's read-only property by going to the properties of the availability group. Right now, this test2 server is not set up to be read-only. So if we try to connect to test2 and query from it, an error will come up saying it's not accessible for queries. Let's set read-only to yes. And now we can query from it. There's also another option here called read intent only. The difference between this and read only yes is with yes, you'll be able to connect to the database, but you won't be able to read from it. With read intent only, connections to the database aren't even allowed unless you specify that you only intend to read the data. And you can do this by adding a property to your connection string called application intent and set it equal to read only. I'll demo that right now. When I run the query, I get an error because I can't even reach the database. And if I try to connect to the database, an error comes up saying it's not accessible. I'll try connecting again. And this time, I'll add the parameter application intent and set it to read only. And now I can connect to the database and I can read from it. Next, let's talk a little bit about the availability group listener. It's not required when setting up an availability group, but if you configure it, you can use that as the server name for clients to connect to. The listener will redirect incoming transactions to the primary server, so clients don't need to know the names of the SQL servers. They don't even need to know which one is the primary. They can just connect to the listener and it will redirect the connection for them. Another feature of the listener is if you have read intent only specified on one of your secondary servers, the listener will automatically redirect read only queries to that secondary server. In this query window, I'm currently connected to JCSQL 2012 test, which is the primary server. I can also connect to it using the listener. So even though I'm connected to AO test 01, the actual server is JC SQL 2012 test. Now let's fill over the availability group to test 2. And this time, I'll have it fill over automatically when something goes down. I'll cause it to fill over by bringing down the primary SQL server. So I'm going to go into services. and stop the SQL Server service.
This should trigger the availability group to fail over to the test2 server. Now back in Management Studio, I'm still going to connect to the listener AO test01. But now it's actually pointing to the test2 server, which is now the primary server. So your application can just connect to the listener and not worry about which server is currently up. So those are just some extra points I wanted to go over concerning availability groups. I hope you found them useful. Thanks for watching.